Are you ready to revolutionize your relationship with money? Welcome to the Finding Financial Freedom podcast with The Frugal Physician, where Dr. Disha Spath will be your companion on this exciting financial adventure. Get ready to conquer debt, build wealth, and embrace a mindful spending lifestyle that will empower you to live life on your own terms. Pearson Rabbits' story begins with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, a passionate ob at the height of her career. But then, a shoulder injury struck during a precipitous delivery. Her dreams were shattered, leaving her unable to practice medicine. Determined to make a difference, Stephanie became an advocate for her peers, guiding them through the complex disability process. Alongside insurance expert Scott Rabbits, Stephanie founded Pearson Rabbits, a company determined to approach insurance differently. Together, they set their mission to educate and empower physicians to protect their most valuable asset, their income, and the most important people in their life, their family. Today, Pearson Rabbits serves the medical community in all 50 states. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand the unique concerns of physicians. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Rabbits builds human connections before they create quotes. Life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness or injury could leave you and your family in a devastating financial situation. But with a little planning and guidance, you can prepare for every possibility. Visit PearsonRabbits.com to schedule your consultation with a Pearson Rabbits advisor. Before we dive into today's episode on mental health coverage, let's start with a question for our audience. Have you or someone you know ever encountered challenges related to mental health coverage? Do you feel like you can reach out for help if you need it? Mental health and burnout are major topics of conversation regarding physicians and healthcare in general these days. But we all know seeking care isn't always so easy. Let's shed light on this important topic together with my guest, Dr. Stephanie Pearson. Cue the show. Welcome to today's interview on the topic of mental health coverage for physicians. In recent years, there's been a growing recognition of the importance of mental health support for healthcare professionals, particularly physicians, who often face unique challenges in their demanding roles. Our discussion today will focus on the evolution of mental health coverage and the steps being taken to ensure adequate support for physicians facing mental health challenges. Joining us today is our guest host, Dr. Stephanie Pearson co-founder of Pearson Rabbits, an insurance broker dedicated to advocating for physicians' disability insurance needs. Dr. Pearson herself went through the process of navigating disability claims and understands firsthand the challenges physicians face. Thank you, Dr. Pearson, for joining us today. Hey, Dr. Speth. I'm glad to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Let's go by first names. Is that okay with you? Perfect. Okay. I'm so glad you're here, Stephanie. You've been a big supporter of us, and we're very, very thankful that you're here today. Well, I'm honored to be part of your journey, and I think what you're doing is amazing, so I'm glad to be part of it. So tell us about yourself and what motivated you to become a passionate advocate and advisor for physicians' insurance needs. Yeah, so I'll give you the kind of a bridge story, but OBGYN by training unfortunately suffered a career-ending injury during a difficult delivery. My patient kicked me in the shoulder. I ended up with a torn labrum. It didn't heal. I developed a frozen shoulder, didn't heal, had surgery, was told I'd be back to work in 12 weeks, and August 3rd will actually be 10 years that I am away from clinical medicine, not that I'm counting. But I learned a lot the hard way about disability and life insurance. It turned out our hospital's group policy and fine print did not cover work-related injuries. And I was flatly denied and told I would have been better off had I fallen off my bike. And then Workman's Comp initially denied my claim because they said while an injury occurred, my frozen shoulder was idiopathic or my fault because I had worked while I was injured, which I did. And I did have two private policies, but found out they weren't quite what I needed. I hadn't really been, in my opinion, properly educated or advocated for either in the beginning or the end when I needed help. My broker was really just not very available. And I started reading everything I could about the topic and figuring I couldn't be the only one who felt this way. And it wasn't The first thing that I did either, 
I initially was like, I'm a doctor. I'm not a salesperson. And I tried to do some doctor things. I did some med mal defense work. I did some biomedical consulting. I did some medical editing. But I kept coming back to this topic more because a lot of my friends and colleagues were asking. And so as I started lecturing to area residency programs, it kind of sort of fell in my lap. But one day my husband was like, hey, maybe this is what you're supposed to be doing. And the rest is history. Wow. What a terrible thing to have to go through. How far along in your career were you when you had this career ending injury? I had been in clinical practice post-residency for just under 10 years. So you had this injury, you continued to work afterwards, and they told you that disqualified you from getting disability benefits because you were aggravating your injury? So there were two parts, right? So the group disability insurance from the hospital, mm-hmm. it, just, it happened at work that facilitated everything. It was in the contract. I didn't know it was in the contract, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, our employer benefits, it's one line on your open enrollment packet. You check a box. Right. You never actually read the fine print. Right. So that was that part. The workman's comp piece was they were holding it against me that I was still working. And of course, I was still working. Most of us, right, you put your head down, you figure out how to compensate. And I did until I couldn't ethically compensate anymore. And I did sue the state and ended up settling because I was in a bad mental place. I had to go to court three times, had never been in court as a physician. And one of those times, a vocational specialist said that I could be a billing secretary making $15 to $18 an hour because I had the aptitude to learn codes. Hmm. And it was kind of the final straw for me. I was just like, this is my life and perfect for this topic. I was suicidal. I wrote letters to my kids. I wrote letters to my husband. I had a plan. I was pretty sure that I was worth more to them dead than alive because I was grossly overinsured for life insurance, underinsured for disability insurance, and was really only thinking about my worth as a financial provider. And it was not a fun time in my life. Obviously, I'm still here, thanks to a lot of intense therapy and pharmacology. Again, apropos to the topic that you want to talk about. Right. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm really, really sorry that you went through such a horrible time in your life. And I'm really proud of you for being able to take those lemons and then turn them into lemonade and just make this your passion and then help other physicians that might be going through the same thing get through this horrible process of, first of all, separating our self-worth from our profession and valuing ourselves, but also figuring out how to protect ourselves better, protect our profession better, protect other doctors better. That's what you're doing. And that's your life's work now. It's just so inspiring to see you on the other end of the journey. Thank you. You know, I'm trying. I think that financial literacy, risk management stuff has come such a long way in the last five, 10 years that just didn't exist 20 something years ago when I was in training. It is nice to have another passion and feel like, okay, if I can't help my patients, I'm helping my colleagues, right? And right. probably get thanked more now yeah. than when I was practicing. <laughs> I, you're the second person that said that to me this week. <laughs> like the people in the finance, you know, just the education space. Yeah. It is so rewarding. But let's go backwards now and let's talk about the mental health portion that you alluded to. A lot of the times, honestly, I think doctors feel like they can't reach out. There's many factors that play into that and we'll go into that. But can you please provide us with an overview of the traditional approach of disability insurance coverage for physicians and how mental health has historically been addressed in insurance? Sure. So admittedly, it was actually the only question that I asked my initial broker. My mom was a terribly controlled bipolar sufferer who had a late break and I was 
terrified that I would turn 40 and have a psych break. Mm -hmm. So literally the only question I asked was who covers OBGYNs in Pennsylvania for mental health? And at the time in 2005, there were only two companies that offered full mental health coverage to OBGYNs. Those were the only two companies that I even looked at. Moving forward over the last several years, there actually have been some good changes in our side. It really has come a long way. Unfortunately, every few years, the pendulum switches back and forth. Right now, there have been some product changes this year, and it used to be that mental health coverage really varied by carrier, mm -hmm. by state, and by what kind of physician you are. Interesting. Why the specialty? Why would that play in? Actuarial claims data, right? <laughs> Interesting. So we're doing our best effort to get people the best coverage that we can, right? Mm -hmm. Carriers are trying to do their risk mitigation in order for them to stay solvent and pay claims that need to be paid. Okay. They're looking for reasons and for things not to cover. There have historically been different trends in who's going out for what. I can tell you on latest reports, the three groups that go out the most for mental health are EM, anesthesia, and OB. Not hmm. really that big of a surprise. The three that have gone out the most for substance abuse have been anesthesia, EM, and psychiatry. I found that one a little bit surprising. And so because of that, and because EM and anesthesia are in the middle of that Venn diagram, Right now, it's almost impossible to get beyond a two-year benefit for EM, anesthesia, and pain. And I add pain because pain used to really just be through anesthesia, but now there are so many ways to get to pain management, and they've been lumped together. Well, there is one company right now where it's two years per episode instead of a two-year aggregate. So in theory, there's no ceiling, but there's some fine print there. Some of the carriers used to have it built into their policies. So we didn't really get to ask. And it was typically a two-year benefit or a five-year benefit. They have since changed and will offer unlimited coverage. Most of the carriers will offer a discount if you opt for less mental health coverage. Mm -hmm. So most of them will say, look, you can have coverage for the life of your policy, but you're going to pay more. Or if you're okay with a two-year benefit, we'll give you 10% off of the life of the policy. There's a financial incentive to being okay with less coverage. And sure. I am definitely of the ilk of I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Absolutely. However, I get that there's, you know, finances involved and some people are blessed enough to have no family history who would seek care if they needed it. Right. It's not uncommon for physicians to opt for that two-year benefit. I do anticipate over the next few years the pendulum will swing back and they may make some other changes. And that's part of the confusion that we sometimes see around this topic is that things change all the time. Yeah. So what I hear you telling me is that recently the mental health benefits have gotten better, or at least the options have yeah. gotten better. So what factors contributed to this shift? I honestly think that it had to do with claims data and making companies more competitive. The playground for disability insurance for physicians is not a big one. There are five kind of companies that we refer to as the big five. There used to be six. One dropped out in May of this year. So now we have five. There are a couple of other companies out there that are a little bit different, but they need to maintain their competitive edge, 
that this is one of the topics to your point of over the last few years, it's really been kind of concentrated that they want to make themselves more competitive. So from your perspective as an insurance broker that's dedicated Mm -hmm. to advocating for physicians, I'm sure that you have had something to do with some of this change. What are some unique considerations or challenges when it comes to providing mental health coverage for physicians compared to other professions? I think that really the biggest barrier is that so many of us already have diagnoses and are being treated. Folks are just waiting too long. One of the reasons that we stress that physicians should be getting this early in their career as possible, right? As residents, as fellows, Mm -hmm. is the hope that you don't carry certain diagnoses yet. And our field is very taxing and there aren't too many of us five to 10 years into attending hood who haven't had to deal with depression or anxiety. Sure. And so ultimately, right, I want to get physicians covered before they even have the diagnosis. One of the issues that we've definitely been running into that we're really trying to champion some change is specific diagnosis codes. So when I first started doing this about seven years ago, anyone that was bipolar carried a bipolar diagnosis. We actually couldn't get covered with the traditional carriers. Now, For certain people with certain symptomatology, with certain stability, we can actually get them covered. Major depressive disorder used to be an automatic limit in what the offer was. We're starting to see some movement with folks that have been stable for a really long time and are still going to therapy. You know, my argument has been, look, I get it. We have this underlying diagnosis and taking meds, but we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And I have to believe that those of us, because I'm part of the crew, right? Those of us in therapy, those of us on medication, I want to believe are less likely to go out on a mental health claim, but I still want to try to get as robust coverage as I can. I would say right now, the big push is trying to get them to understand, and by them, I mean underwriters and the Mm -hmm. carriers, that really major depressive disorder, if stable, if being treated, I just don't see how that should be treated any differently than depression NOS or generalized depression. We're really all doing the same thing. Interesting. It's good to know that, you know, all the extra clicks that we have to do with the ICD-10 coding for in remission or stable actually means something on the insurance side. It means a lot. And, you know, I don't want to make anyone mad at me. I really would love for only psychiatrists to diagnose MDD, an issue with kind of EMR sweep that I like that's been coined or not, but you check these boxes and unless they get unchecked, they just keep going. You're so right about that. I mean, I'm primary care, so culprit. However, I will tell you a challenge is trying to get people into psychiatry to get them to treat depression, just major depression is just, it's very hard. hard. I want everyone, please don't, this is not just physician talk, but I want everyone to get the mental health care that they need. And I'm well aware that we need more people out there There have been many a time where I'm speaking to a potential client and they think that they carry a generalized depression diagnosis. And then we get records and lo and behold, MDD has been clicked off and then they fight or push back on me. I don't meet the definition of that. And I'm like, okay, well, then you're going to have to find a psychiatrist to potentially refute your primary care, your OB, your family practice doc. So it just makes things that much harder. You know, one of the things I tell people all the time is check your own EMR. You know, right. sure that you agree with what's being written. Yeah. Personal story. When I applied for disability insurance, one document that was populated by a student at a psychiatrist 
emerged and they were like, by the way, all this stuff was documented. And I was like, what are you talking about? It was all wrong, you know, right. but it was a big deal on that end. And to that point too, we need to be careful about what we're putting in HPIs. Mm -hmm. And I am all about, there are certain things that need to be written. There are certain things that you need for good follow-up, but mm -hmm. there are also things that maybe if we were handwriting notes like the old days, it wouldn't have necessarily been written down. I had a case where a note materialized and I had a 30-something-year-old female who literally there was a line in one note that when she was 15, she thought about killing herself and dropped her Walkman in the bathtub. She's 32 now. Right. I like to think like, how is that going to change your management? How is that going to change your care moving forward? It really jammed her up. And I was like, oh my God, what 15-year-old angsty girl? Does it not pass your mind? I don't know. And maybe I'm wrong. I might get a lot of hate mail now. I just think that sometimes we're just go, 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 go. And we were taught, at least I was taught, you know, in med school and residency, you write down everything the patient says. And the HPI is, you know, the end all be all. I think listening is more important. And I know that we're rushed and we don't have the time. And some of it is because you're giving yourself a note so you can look back later. These have real ramifications for people. I don't know if the problem is documentation, but it's certainly the fact that that gets equated, put it into the insurance calculation. The fact that this is a healthcare document, you know, it's legal document that goes to the insurance companies and the insurance companies get to change our rates. I mean, I think that's wrong on a principal level. But I think that's a very important point that you bring up that we do need to be mindful that we are documenting in a legal record as well. Who is advocating for us on the insurance side to make these sorts of adjustments, you know, less common? That's a great question. And I don't mean this to come across the way it's going to sound. Like aside from me, I don't know. I'm only me and our company is one company of many. I'd like to think that there are other brokers out there. I'm sure there are that are properly advocating for people, but I can obviously really only speak to myself and our company. Are any societies advocating? Do you know? Not that I know of to the insurance carriers. I know that a lot of docs who are working within their own hospital systems to mm -hmm. advocate. There's also kind of a push for trainees to have more access. But again, there's the double-edged sword. Once you meet with a therapist, once you meet with a psychiatrist, a social worker, you name it, there's a code generated. Even if they don't give you medicine, even if you think it is protected, they're not. It's one of the things that really gets me having been through years and years of therapy. Look, I wish psych notes were under lock and key, right? right? We want people to be comfortable sharing the honest truth. It's the only way that we can help get better. It always is going to come back to community medicine and insurance medicine are not the same. Mm -hmm. And these companies need to stay solvent and they need to look for things not to cover and at the end of the day, and I hate saying this, it's going to sound really mean, I guess, but their private policy is that people don't have to purchase, right? So that whole idea of genetics shouldn't affect health insurance. Well, health insurance right now is in a very different category than things like disability and life insurance. Right. And so the rules don't equate and they yeah. don't match. All we can do is try to advocate one case at a time, one topic at a time, you know, and hope that we can afford some change. Absolutely. I don't think it's mean for you to say that. It's realistic. It's you're giving us the information, you know, what the rules are and what's the current reality. And like you mentioned, I have seen there has been more of a push from the healthcare institution side to support physicians. As you mentioned, a lot of physicians are afraid to seek that help because 
even if we apply for a license in a different state, a lot of the times you have to check that box that says you've previously sought treatment for mental health conditions. You know, you're afraid you're not going to get a license because you've previously been depressed for six months, right? And I'm sure no one will give it to us that it's proprietary. I would love to see how many physicians have not been able to get licensed because of that stuff, because it's such a pervasive diagnosis amongst us. Right. And I don't know why it's any different than if we have high blood pressure or or diabetes. And I do know that some states and societies have started dropping the mental health questions. I want to say it came out. Yeah, there has been a push from the societies to get rid of that question. You know, that's wonderful that they're doing that. And I always tell people, Disha, that I don't want to see people cut their nose to spite their face. And seeking treatment, even if it means that your private policy is not going to cover you for mental health or substance abuse, it's still going to cover you for the three million other things that could potentially happen. And for the people that are afraid to get their care, you're more likely to end up with a problem that may be more tragic than you not being able to do your job. I am a firm believer in people should be getting the care that they need. That's what's going to make us productive. That's what's going to keep us moving forward. Burnout is a big problem. Part of burnout is just general mental health depression, anxiety, you know, we need to get that addressed. It's huge for our longevity. Yeah, totally agree. In your experience, what role should healthcare institutions and organizations play in supporting mental health for physicians? What are some best practices and models that you've seen healthcare institutions institute? I would say I'm starting, and this is really word of mouth, that a couple of women that I've spoken to have made coaching or mental health care, one of their negotiation points Mm -hmm. on their contracts and have been successful. We've talked to a couple of groups that provide mental health assistance that are going into hospitals and universities and saying, look, we want to make ourselves available. They're actually being taken up on it. I think that from an institution standpoint, look, if I had my druthers, we would get a new job and that would be part of our actual physician onboarding training, right? We have to do so much CME that in my opinion is useless. I still do mine, but how about continuing medical education? How about if mental health was part of that? Don't tell us that we should go do yoga and take a coffee break, but all of this costs money. That would be my kind of caviar wish, right? Yeah. I think from a smaller standpoint, and I mean more like associations, our own kind of groups, is to push to their hospitals and try to make it about money. What does it actually cost to replace a physician? What does it cost to retrain What does it cost in the other stuff right now that I'm a business owner? (laughs) Listen, the other stuff adds up, right? Yeah, absolutely. Health insurance, life insurance, dental insurance, you know, 401ks, recruiting, all of that. I think that if someone could actually put a dollar, and maybe it's already out there, that we need as groups to start making it about dollars, right? And yeah figure out a way to make it cheaper for the C-suite of hospitals to provide care than it is to replace people. Yeah, absolutely. I am just Googling it right now. How much does it cost to replace a physician? $100,000 to $500,000. So that's per physician, right? Per physician. So if they're saying $100,000 to $500,000, I am sure that they could spend way less than that to hire a few counselors to be available for their staff. Absolutely. Or they don't even have to hire them. Actually, I just joined a group that offers five sessions of therapy or five sessions of coaching as soon as you start. So I took them up on the coaching as I will show them. That's great. Let's do it. Yeah. That kind of stuff that I think will hopefully 
start to be seen more. Yes, absolutely. And I do love the increased focus on physician burnout has been really good for supporting mental health for physicians. And as we get into disability insurance and life insurance coverage, sure, that will it might raise our rates. But in the end, our longevity in our careers is really the biggest impact on the bottom line. Yeah. So if we can stay in the field longer, stay happier longer, everyone does better. Patients do better. Our institutions do better. And we do better. Absolutely. And on the flip side, did not get a ton of support within the physician community when I left. Um, it continues to be hit or miss. I'll get the, oh, kick me in the shoulder, medicines going down the tubes and oh my God. You know, blah, blah, blah. And in the beginning, it really stung and was part of why I had to go to therapy. Hmm. Now, I'm a lot more confident and much healthier headspace. But to be quite honest, we need to do a better job at taking care of our own. Yeah. And, you know, similarly to how other social media groups, you know, get started. One of the things I did, and I don't remember how long into my recovery, but I started a secret Facebook group. It's called Physicians for Physicians, and it's just for community and support and resources for physicians who, because of injury or illness, have either had to change their scope of practice or leave clinical medicine. We all have the same stories of other physicians who were not very nice to us. And I just want to throw that out there because I do think that as a whole, with emotional IQ being a hot topic and people paying more attention, I think that it's gotten a little bit better but we could still use some work in that vein. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, there's, especially when you are a public persona, there's a lot that comes at you, positive and negative, you know, a lot of positives. <laughs> also, a lot of negatives. <laughs> and I'm so thankful that you built the group, Physicians for Physicians, so that we can advocate for ourselves and be that support that we need in the times that we're low. Everyone is low at some point or another. Right. And it's an important Thing to keep in mind that kindness goes a long way. Kindness towards our peers and empathy. Absolutely. You mentioned earlier that you saw the pendulum swinging the other way when it comes to mental health. What kind of changes or disadvantages do you see coming in the next few years? I am concerned that more groups of physicians are going to be lumped in with EM anesthesia and pain and only getting offered a two-year benefit. I am also concerned that kind of some of the post-COVID, long COVID stuff will factor into that decision. I just think there's going to be a bigger push to not cover us. I mean, that's what I think. I hope I'm wrong. Again, at least in the last two years, the pendulum has swung in our favor, but I'm nervous that it's not going to stay there. Well, it's a good word of caution and good reminder to our listeners that if this is important to you, that you need to advocate. You need to advocate for us through our societies and bring this up, continue to bring it up because it's important to have our voices out there supporting each other. I don't think I could have said it better than you just said it. I think that the best we can do is just keep pushing, right? And keep advocating for this and being the voice to the higher ups to see the importance in this. Absolutely. Are there any additional resources or support systems that you would recommend for physicians seeking mental health assistance or information on coverage? Coverage part's the easiest. Obviously, you want to reach out to somebody that you can trust and feel like you're getting properly educated and being set up for realistic expectations. I think that making sure that you actually get a copy of your company's group policy, just yep. so you know what you have and don't have. It is fairly common for employer benefits to have a one or two year benefit for mental health. That's pretty common but some have other things that they throw in there. It's important from an educational standpoint to have that stuff. 
you know, strongly urge everybody to get the care that you need. If I'm going to speak as a DI broker, get disability insurance in place before you do that, but don't let an underlying diagnosis keep you from getting disability insurance because, again, there's millions of other things that are going to potentially take people out of practice. This shouldn't keep you from doing that. Just because you're not going to have a five-year, you know, mental health benefit doesn't mean you shouldn't protect yourself from having a car crash, you know, tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Pearson, do you have any final thoughts for us regarding mental health coverage for physicians? I think that if you can get it, get it. Again, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. We'll play within the confines that we can and advocate in the best way that we can. And we have to take care of ourselves. Well, it's nice to know that we have one of our own in the field that we can go to for advice and, of course, brokerage as well. Really, really appreciate your time being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Pearson, for sharing your insights and personal experiences as a physician and advocate for physicians' disability insurance needs. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand that life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness, injury, or catastrophic event could put you and your family in a devastating financial situation. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Rabbits builds human connections before they create quotes. Visit www.pearsonrabbits.com today and embark on your journey to safeguarding your future. Thank you again for your valuable input. And that's a wrap, my frugal physician friends. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Finding Financial Freedom podcast with the Frugal Physician. Remember, you have the power to take control of your financial destiny and create a life of abundance. It's all within your power. Stay tuned for more exciting episodes where we'll continue to explore the world of frugality and financial freedom. The content shared on this podcast should not be taken as individualized financial advice. We are here to share our knowledge and experiences, but it's is crucial to consult with professionals such as accountants, financial advisors, or attorneys who can provide personalized guidance based on your specific needs.